Bishop Michael Konko. What a gift, what a gift to us. Uh, please be seated. It's always an honor to be here uh, for Kingdom Life. Been coming for quite a bit, and it's always refreshing. Uh, one of the greatest things is to meet Bishop Mike and Bishop Peace and uh, the gentleman from Zimbabwe. <laughs> Uh, and to share fellowship. So it's always a great joy to be here. Uh, and also to just be in an atmosphere where the Word of God is respected and, and, and there is sound teaching of the Word of God. Uh, because there, there are conferences you go to and you have to be very careful what you preach. You have to navigate yourself well. Otherwise you destroy a lot of sacred cows and, uh, and cause a lot of confusion. But when we come here, we are fully confident in the Lord and we are able to bring the word that the Lord has for us. Amen. So Bishop Mike, it's an honor to be here one more time. You're still growing younger every day. I don't know how you do it. I think your wife does a good job and takes good care of you. And uh, we are looking forward to next year very excitedly, very excitedly. It's going to be massive. It's going to be massive. We're looking forward to it. And uh, we will all storm here and be part of what God is doing. Amen. 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 We had a great word from Bishop uh, Bismarck, uh, just walking us through Jesus Christ and his works and, and the message they bring across, not just the work itself, but the meaning of it. Thank you so much. Um, incidentally, uh, Bishop, in our church, our theme for 2025 is Jesus. It's Jesus. So uh, I'm, I'm going to preach a lot of Jesus next year. Uh, this year our theme was God and I have spent much of the time teaching on God and who he is and his eternality and infinity, immutability and all the things about God and next year we will focus on Jesus. It's good for the church to get back to basics. Amen. Of course at the center of our Christian faith, at the foundation of our Christian faith, is Jesus Christ. There is nothing we can seek to do, desire, pray for, hope for, believe for, that if it is outside of Christ has validity. Everything we preach, everything we believe, everything we desire must be centered on Christ Jesus. And before I get to my message, I just want to us to take a look at a passage in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, and verses 19 and uh, 20. Ephesians chapter 2, 19 and 20. And it says you are now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners. There's a housefly here that is tabernacled around me, but uh, we resist it. And uh, should we bind it or kill it? <laughs> yeah. Okay. We'll live with you. Don't worry. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. It's a very powerful statement talking about what Christianity is all about. And it says that, we are built on the foundation of the apostles 
and the prophets, Jesus is the chief cornerstone. So what, what the passage is saying is that Christianity has two major foundations it builds on, the prophets and the apostles. The prophets and the apostles. And Jesus is the chief cornerstone. Now the idea of a chief cornerstone is a foundation stone on which the, it's a, it's a stone on which a foundation is joined together. And it's both at the bottom of the building and at the top of the building. It caps the building. And so the passage says Jesus is that. But the foundation is laid with the prophets and the apostles. Now, one of the challenges we have as Christians, especially Pentecostal Christians, is that because we are theologically very deficient most of the time and not very theological, when we just see words in the Bible, we give them any meaning that comes into our minds. So uh, when the Bible says that the apostle and the prophets are the foundation, the easiest thing to think is that people who call themselves prophets are the foundation and people who call themselves apostles are the foundation of the church. Now, if you have that thinking, then everybody would want to call themselves an apostle, a prophet, because then they become the foundation, uh, which cannot be shaken. So what does the passage mean when it says the prophets? And what does the passage mean when it says apostles? Because they are critical to everything we know about Christianity. The prophets in this passage is talking specifically about the Old Testament prophets who prophesied about the captivity of Israel to Assyria and to Babylon. And those prophets who also prophesied the return and those prophets who prophesied during the time of the return. And those prophets will start uh, in a technical sense from Isaiah and end with Ezra. And that's the prophets he's talking about. So why is the Bible saying that they are the foundations of Christianity or the foundations of the church or we are built on the foundation? Because the prophets who prophesied at that time, if you read Isaiah, Jeremiah, you read Ezekiel, you read all of them, uh, Joel and Obadiah, Nahum, Habakkuk, read all of them. Uh, they spoke about two major things that is going to happen. First, they said Israel is going to go into captivity. And when they go into captivity, it will be the end of an era. And they also prophesied that when that happens and the end of that era comes, God will start something new. And they call it a new covenant. Some of them call it the coming of a new spirit. Uh, Joel talked about the outpouring of the spirit upon all flesh. All of them were saying something new is about to break out. And it's going to break out when Israel goes into captivity. And in most of their prophecies, they spoke about something that was going to come. They spoke about somebody who would come as a king on the throne of David. They spoke about somebody who would come as a suffering servant and would suffer for the people. And then they also talked about a coming kingdom, that the kingdom was going to come. So that's what the prophets are talking about. So when you read from Isaiah, you see that theme running through. It's in Jeremiah's running through all of them. That there, will be, that there will be the end of an era. There will be a beginning of a new era. In the new era, there will be a new kingdom. There will be a new king. And then there will be a suffering servant. 
Now, the, 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 the Jews were looking forward to that. But in their minds, when the prophets spoke about a king who was coming, they thought of a king just like David, a political king, one who would lead them into battle and fight off their enemies and destroy their enemies. When they, he talked about the kingdom, they thought Israel was going to become a superpower again uh, to fulfill the purposes of God. And, and they didn't know much what to do with the suffering servant because it didn't work too much into their view of a king and of a kingdom. So if you re remember your New Testament, the last question the disciples of Jesus asked him just before he ascended, the last final question, they've been with him all this time, they see him resurrected, they said, Sir, will you at this time, now that you're about to go, will you restore the kingdom to Israel? Because that is how they understood it, that this kingdom was for Israel. But there is something else that the prophets spoke about. These prophets said that this new era would also bring in the Gentiles. Those who are not Jews will come into the kingdom and, and they would come to Jerusalem, they will worship Jerusalem. And, and so you see that almost all the prophecies about Jesus, beginning from John the Baptist to Jesus, spoke about the era of the Gentiles, other people coming in. So the Bible is saying that you cannot talk about Christianity without the prophets because they pointed to what is going to happen. Then the Bible talks about the apostles. Who are the apostles? Who are these people? The apostles are the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, the direct apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul, they are the apostles. And Paul was not a direct apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. He received uh, a, a revelation of Jesus Christ, but he wasn't physically with Jesus Christ. That's why he had to go to Jerusalem to present what he had received to the apostles who were with Jesus to validate him that he was also now qualified to be an apostle. The critical thing about the apostles and the prophets is that they were inspired to write what we call scripture. So anybody who writes scripture had to be a prophet or an apostle. After scripture was closed, God is not raising new apostles after that kind. There may be people who are called apostles now, but they don't have canonical authority. So what happens is the prophet says, he's coming. And the apostles say, he has come. One says, look for him. The other says, there he is. So the prophets point to the coming Messiah. The apostles are telling us he has come and there is nobody else coming after this one who has come. And Jesus Christ is the foundation or the chief cornerstone. I hope you understand it. You cannot have the New Testament without the Old Testament. The New Testament and the Old Testament are not antagonistic. They are not fighting one another. The New Testament and the Old Testament are complementary because one points to the one who is coming. The other one says he has come and teaches about what it means for him to come. Without the, New Test without the Old Testament, there can be no Christianity. Without the Old Testament, there can be no Christianity because Christianity's scripture was the Old Testament. Paul preached from the Old Testament. Peter preached from the Old Testament. Jesus himself preached from the Old Testament, but he preached from the prophets most of the time and sometimes from the writings or the Psalm, but mainly the prophets. On the day of Pentecost, you remember what happened when people were speaking in tongues and all of that and, and people thought these people were, were drunk. What did Peter do? He got up 
and he pointed to the prophets and said, this is what the prophets were talking about when they said, in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and so and so forth. Peter is saying, without the prophets, our experience is invalid because they spoke about it and Christ came to fulfill it. Our job as apostles is to say that what the prophets mentioned has now been fulfilled in Christ. I hope you, I hope you get that. So, many times, you know, when we look at the Bible, and this is just my introduction before I get in my message, um, because I'm going to teach on Jesus. Many times when we say the Old Testament, the word old gives the impression of something that is weak, frail, and discarded. It's like the way we, we say, my clothes are old. It means I have to dispose of them. But old can also mean earlier. And when it's, it means earlier, it doesn't mean something that is past, but something that came first and something else that has come on top of what came first. When we see the Old Testament as earlier and the New Testament as now or later, then the earlier and the later are joined together, all pointing us to one man, Jesus Christ, and his work and the fullness of what he brought to us. Amen. This evening, I want to teach on a subject that I have titled Made Rich Through Christ. Made Rich Through Christ. As I've said, Jesus is at the center of our faith. And one of the challenges for uh, the Pentecostals and particularly Charismatics that we preach a message that sometimes people don't think is accurate. Uh, we preach that God prospers people and we preach uh, prosperity and people call it the prosperity gospel although I think it's a theologically wrong description of the fullness of that message. I, I believe the best way to describe it is abundant life message, not prosperity, because uh, charismatics preach that the life of Christ is, doesn't only have a spiritual component, it also has a material component. And both the spiritual and material component must be joined together to fully appreciate what Jesus came to do for us. And one of the places where people struggle is whether Christians should prosper, whether God wants us to prosper, should a Christian be rich, and, and all of that, and doesn't it go against Jesus Christ, and isn't it all, uh, you, know, uh, you know, just a false doctrine, and so on and so forth. So I'm going to focus on that in the next 30 or so minutes, and just hope that I can situate that theology properly, and then afterwards I'm going to pray that what Christ did for us will be manifest in our lives. Amen? Amen? All right. So we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Now, if you know your New Testament well, you know that 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, Paul is talking about money. In fact, the whole two chapters, he's talking about money and giving and, and, the, and the results of it and all of that because they were talking about raising money uh, to go and help some needy Christians in the early church. So uh, the whole of 2 Corinthians chapter 8, chapter 9 is, is about material things, about money. He brings in faith and he brings in other things, but basically he's teaching about money. And he gets to this point and puts out this information. It says, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a very interesting thing. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich, yet for our sakes, he became poor, 
that you through his poverty might become rich. Now, when we talk about what Jesus did for us, there are two words that you must keep in mind. The first one is substitution. And the second word is sacrifice. When we say substitution, it means that Jesus did some things for us in our place. And then when we say sacrifice, we say that Jesus suffered for some things so that we will benefit. So there are things he did in substitution for us. He stood in our place and did it for us. And then there are things he did so that we can benefit from. So those, those are two important ways to look at the work of Jesus Christ and how he gave us salvation from sin and all of that. So the verse focuses on riches and poverty. Riches and poverty. So I just want to focus on those two words. When the passage uses the word rich, in this verse, it means to be wealthy, to have abundance, and to be privileged. To be wealthy, to have abundance, to be privileged. So it says that, look at the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at his generosity. Look at the favor he extends towards us, that though he was rich, he was wealthy, he was privileged, he had more than abundance. Jesus was rich. And the word rich here goes beyond having sufficiency. Having sufficiency is what you need for the day, give us this day our daily bread. You need today, you get it. That's not rich, that is sufficiency. But here, it didn't say Jesus Christ had sufficiency, it says he was rich. The second word here is the word poor. And it means, in this context, it means to be destitute, deprived of wealth or position. So this poverty here is not simply talking about not having money in your pocket, but being drained of dignity, of honor, of position, and, and everything that makes you have confidence materially. So the passage then says, Jesus Christ became poor, although he was rich. So, if we say, the passage then says, Jesus was rich, and the word rich means he was privileged, he had wealth, he had abundance, in what sense was Jesus rich? In what sense was Jesus rich in? What was he rich in? Did Jesus have Naira? I don't think so. Maybe he had cities, but... Definitely not Naira. Did he have dollars? No. Did he have pounds? No. He did, did, did he have uh, uh, physical uh, buildings? No. So in what sense was he rich? He was rich in glory. He was rich in glory. That means the glory of the Godhead, the glory of divinity, the glory of being creator. The glory of being creator of the universe. He is rich in glory, in position, in prestige. He was rich in all of that. He was also rich because he owned all things. He owned all things. Not all things we know, but all things we don't even know. The other time I was reading... Uh, you know, I, I, I read quite a lot of uh, astronomy, not astrology, but astro the universe and the planets and, and so on. So I, I read that there was a, a planet somewhere uh, many light years away from us, which is totally made of diamond. The entire planet, many times bigger than the Earth. The whole planet 
is diamond. That's one of the times you just feel that the Holy Ghost will transport you in the spirit <laughs> and bring you back suddenly. <laughs> but it's made of diamond, the entire planet. Mountains are diamond. Everything is diamond. And guess who owns it? Jesus. That's just one of the tiny little trinkets he has. So when the Bible says he's rich, don't think of your uncle and don't think of Elon Musk and don't think of... That you, you are talking about... I mean, that one planet of diamond will blow all the earth's wealth away. So Jesus was rich in glory, rich because he's owner of all things. So then the passage says that he became poor. So Jesus is rich. He has the glory of the Godhead. He owns all things. He became poor. In what way did he become poor? Last year when I was here, I talked about the incarnation. And if you remember, I said there are two words, theological words that are important. The incarnation means Jesus became flesh. And the word became flesh and amongst the incarnation, he, that he, he took on flesh. That's one thing. But there is also another uh, theological word, kenosis. Kenosis means that Jesus emptied himself of what he had. He emptied himself. So not only did he become a man, but he emptied himself of all that he had. He took everything he had and put it aside. So, in what way did he become poor? He became poor in his incarnation and in the kenosis because he took everything he had out of him, of his glory, and he became a human being. Philippians 2 puts it this way from verse 6, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. He made himself. He wasn't made. He it's his grace. He did it by himself, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. That is kenosis. He emptied himself. So he had glory. He had all things. And the Bible says he emptied himself. He became poor. So he became poor in his incarnation, but not only that, he also became poor in his earthly life. Jesus was a very poor man. He was. Jesus was poor. He was very, very, he was poor and his parents were poor. Jesus was not materially wealthy by any definition of wealth. He was poor when he was born. His parents, earthly parents, Joseph and Mary, offered a poor man's offering in the temple. They're supposed to offer a lamb, and the law makes provision. If you are poor, you offer turtle doves, two doves. And they went for turtle doves. So they were poor. Mary and Joseph were poor. Not only were the parents poor, the son inherited the poverty too. Jesus was very poor. He was very poor. He had nowhere to lay his head. He didn't have money. When he had to pay taxes, he had no savings, he had no investment. He had to trust a miracle. Not of abundance, but a miracle of barely enough to pay his tax, to pay Peter's tax, and there is nothing left over. He was taken care of in his ministry by some women. He couldn't take care physically of his own earthly ministry needs. He couldn't buy things by himself. People had to take care of him, and the women fed him clothed him, uh, not clothed him, but fed him uh, uh, and, and supported him. And a few people would give money for the travel needs of his team and so on and so forth. But they were very, 
very poor. He had nowhere to lay his head. Jesus never owned a home. And it is generally believed that Jesus wore the same set of clothes for three years. Which was not strange in the days of Jesus. Uh, people will wear the same thing. You know, you just wash it, let it dry, and put it on. And wear the same thing. That's the same clothing he died in. It's a very poor man. We cannot preach prosperity through the lifestyle of Jesus. We can't. It, it, the biblical evidence doesn't support that Jesus was a rich man. He was poor. Very poor. But he was poor not by force, but by choice. Are you following me? It's not, it's not that... Poverty was forced on him, but it is because he chose. Remember the passage says, consider the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at his heart. Consider his heart. Consider his, his favor. Consider the generosity of heart he has. That although he had all things, when he came on earth, he emptied himself of everything and chose intentionally purposefully, deliberately to be poor. Because everything Jesus did that was deliberate and intentional had either substitutionary effect or sacrificial effect. He was either doing it for us or he was doing it in our place. When he died on the cross, it was substitutionary and it was sacrificial, substitutionary because he took our place on the cross and died for us and sacrificed his blood for us, not for himself. Not so that we will also go and die on a cross. Because if he did it as an example, then every Christian somewhere in our lives should be crucified. If his crucifixion is an example. It means that as they do somewhere in the Philippines, every Easter, people get crucified because they are imitating Jesus. If Jesus' crucifixion was for our example and imitation, then it means that each one of us must be crucified. But his crucifixion was not for our example. It was for our substitution and it was sacrificial. He did it so we will not suffer it. Are you following me? He did it so we will not suffer it. He went to hell so we will not go to hell. He died so we may have life. He was beaten on his back so our bodies can be mended. It is all substitution and sacrifice. So based on the general theme of what Jesus did for us, Paul is now saying it's not just about your sin. It's not just about your healing. It's not only about that your peace for which he was chastised, but there's another aspect of what Jesus did for you that is being presented now, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes, not for his sake, for our sake, for our benefit, for our substitution, he became poor, so that we, through his poverty, might be made rich now some people interpret this to mean Jesus is talking about spiritual poverty but Jesus was not poor spiritually he was not poor spiritually Jesus although he took of his divine nature, he was always rich spiritually. Always. He had contact with the Father. He, he was spiritual, he was not, never spiritually despondent or destitute. He was spiritually rich. So we cannot say, 
and interpret it honestly as Jesus or the Paul talking about spiritual riches and spiritual poverty. Because the whole context of 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 is not talking about spiritual poverty and, and spiritual wealth. It's talking about people who are literally poor who need literal money. So the analogy cannot transcend the context of literalness and go into metaphor. So he's talking about Jesus becoming physically poor. For what purpose? So that we, through his poverty, might be made rich. We, through the entrance of his poverty, through the way he opened through his poverty, just like we through his stripes get healing, so that, uh, and we through his, his crucifixion get redemption, we through his poverty can also access riches. So in this passage, therefore, the Apostle Paul positions the prosperity, material prosperity of the believer within the context of his redemption and within the context of what Christ did for us. Does it mean, therefore, that every believer instantly will get rich? No. And I'll come to that. God is a God of redemption. In the book of Genesis, we read that when Adam and Eve sinned, God threw about a couple of curses and said some things were going to happen. And uh, the devil got his bit. Well, whoever that thing was, the serpent got his bit. And then Adam got his bit. And Eve got her bit. But what he said to Adam is, because of what you have done, the earth, not you, the earth is cursed for your sake. God never cursed Adam. He cursed the earth because of what the man has done, but he was not cursed. But then within that curse, there was redemption. And what is redemption? Because it's almost like God shut the door and opened the door at the same time. And he said, by your sweat, the sweat of your face and your toil, you shall eat from the earth. So the earth is cursed and it produces thorns and thistles. So ordinarily, if you just try to cultivate food from the earth, you will not have food, Mr. Adam. You're going to be hungry because the earth now is, is bearing the brunt of what you have done, so it's not supposed to feed you. But you can overcome that curse. How are you going to overcome the curse? Through the sweat of your face, through your toil. So therefore, toil and labor was not a curse, but a redemption from the curse. Hard work is not cursed. Hard work redeems us from the curse of the earth. So the earth, naturally, if you are lazy, the earth will be a curse for you. But if you are hardworking and you toil and you put in energy, the earth, which ordinarily is a curse, becomes a blessing for it because you will eat from it. You don't eat thorns and thistles. You eat cultivated food. In other words, if you leave the earth fallow, you'll get thorns and thistles. But if you take charge of it, you will produce what you need out of the earth. So in the curse, there is redemption. I know sometimes we say that not labor, but favor. 
but there is no dichotomy between labor and favor. It is not either or, it is both and. It is labor produces favor. If I labor, I will be favored. If the earth is producing thorns and I labor and I sweat, I will eat from the earth. So God, even in the Garden of Eden, provides redemption from a cursed earth. So if Christ became poor so we can become rich, how do we access that? Because if we want to access salvation, we don't do it through work. We do it through faith. We believe in what Christ has done for us. But if you want to prosper, you don't access it through faith alone, but you access it faith backed by enormous work. A lot of work. Faith, hard work, labor, cultivating your land, cultivating your prosper property, thinking about your business, Planning it well is what makes the blessing of prosperity work on your behalf. It doesn't happen when you just confess, I am rich, 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 I am rich. It's just like a person can say, Christ died for me, Christ died for me, Christ died for me, Christ died for me, and say that till he gets to hell. Because saying Christ died for you will not give you salvation. You have to believe that he died for you so that you will not die in order to get the benefit of what he did. So you don't prosper by faith. I will put it this way, by faith alone. You prosper by faith and hard work. And hard work is not a punishment. Hard work is your redemption. Hard work is the access into God's prosperity. So when we preach prosperity as part of the blessing of the believer, we are not preaching laziness as a way to prosper. We are saying that Christ has already opened the door for you to prosper. You enter through that door through sweat and labor. And then in Genesis, he said to the woman, it's going to be tough. But with hard work and labor, you will produce babies. That's not a curse. That's redemption. It's telling you it's going to be tough for you, but you can overcome it. You're going to press through. You're going to work hard. You're not going to give up. You're not going to give up. You're going to work hard. If it's a toil, that toil produces your child. So within the ambit of difficulty, God provides us the way out of hardship and things that are supposed to be a curse. So if, I, if somebody comes to tell me that their village is cursed because of whatever, happen. As a believer, how do I respond to it? I'm going to respond to it the way I understand the scripture, that the way out of a curse is sweat and toil. Because you know why I know? If we evacuate all the people from your village, take all of them, the chief, everybody, take everybody, the dog, the goats, every, take all the chickens, take everybody from your village out to Singapore and they bring Singaporeans into your village, the curse will not work on them. The village which is supposed to be cursed and the spirits and evil spirits are the ones and all kinds of the fathers, all the African nonsense we believe in. These people will come and live there and in 10 years, 
turn your village to Singapore. Why didn't the curse overcome them? Because the way to overcome the curse is through hard work, productive labor, thinking, planning, strategic planning, being careful, being precise, being accurate, studying the rainfall pattern, studying the waterfall patterns in your village, understanding the flow of the river. The river is not a god, it is just water flowing up and down. Once you deify a river, you become a slave to its manipulation. So when it is dried up, instead of finding out whether we are overdrawing from the water, you are going to find out which God or who sinned, who committed abomination for the river to dry. Yeah, they will ask for sacrifice. Unfortunately, a lot of preachers preach a Christian version of that. I call it Christian Africanism. We are preaching and we call it revelation and we call it deep things, but it's not deep. It is very localized. It is village preaching, uh, Christianized. Because the reason why people are not prospering is not because there is an extraordinary curse that is beyond the redemption of Christ. If he gave up all things so that we through his poverty might be made rich, how dare you think that your grandfather who stole some coconut three generations away has done something so powerful as to negate the work of Jesus Christ over his descendants who are born again. How dare you believe that? There is no curse in your family. There is no curse in your bloodline. There is no curse in your, wherever you are, that supersedes the enormous sacrifice of Jesus Christ when he laid off his glory and stepped into time and became poor and suffered poverty and had nowhere to lay his head for people to feed him and he did all that when he owned everything so that we his disciples will not have such a miserable life the prosperity message the abundant life message is deeply embedded in the Christology of Christ. It is deeply embedded in the work of redemption. It is deeply embedded in the mission of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's deeply embedded in the prophecies of the prophets who talked about trees being planted in the desert places and talked about water springing forth in desert places. They spoke about people who live in dry places enjoying abundance of life and the rivers of God flowing to them. Those in desolate heights are going to have rivers pop up for them in the desolate heights. Those in the valleys are going to have fountains pop up for them. That is what the prophet said in the era of Jesus Christ. Those who dwell in the wilderness will be watered. And why would they, how did it become possible? Because Jesus Christ emptied himself of every privilege so that we will become the privileged ones. He wore the same clothes so you will not wear the same clothes. If you choose to as a fashion statement, that's fine. If you, if you love your clothes so much, you say, I will not change, that's fine. If you love your body so much, you say, I will not bath by choice. That is up to you. I will not oppose you. But if it has been imposed on you by the circumstances of life and nature and the force of your circumstances, then I came here to announce to you that Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, the Redeemer, the Son of God, became poor so that we, through his poverty, might be made rich. 
God is not against his children becoming rich. He is not against it. He embraces it. He planned for it. Christ came for it. But we're not going to talk our way through it. We're not going to think that just attending prayer meeting, prayer meeting, prayer meeting, prayer meeting, you'll prosper. No. You're not going to think that one day you'll just be walking on the road and, and, and then you kick a rock and underneath I have dollars. No, it's not going to happen that way. There'll be no money under your pillow tomorrow morning. It's not going to happen that way. But if you labor and you sweat and you wake up in the morning and you go to work and you put urgency and diligence and effort into your work and you build all the right habits, then God said, the earth will not be a curse for you. The earth will be a blessing for you. The earth will be a blessing for you. The earth will provide what you must eat and you will have in abundance. So we must teach the theology of work as redemption. We must teach the theology of work as redemption. You cannot hide laziness behind Christ. We cannot hide laziness behind Christ. We must teach work. The apostle Paul was so bold as to say, he who does not work must not eat. Why? He's referring to Genesis. If you don't work, you will have thistles. But if you work, you will eat. And he who does not work must not eat. We must earn what we have. I believe in favor, but I also believe that you must have money that you are proud and dignified that you have. That nobody pitied you to give it to you. Nobody just looked at you and said, poor thing, and gave you some money. But you sweated by your own brows, you work hard for it, you burn the midnight oil, and you stayed up at night, and you cried to God, and you worked, and you worked, and the heavens opened over you and blessed you then you can look at that wealth. And that's the kind of thing that you bring to God. It's a sweet smelling sacrifice because it smells of your sweat. It smells of your labor. It smells of your hard work. It smells of your difficulty. And you say, Lord, now I give this to you. I sacrifice it to you because it came from my sacrifice, my hard work. And that is the kind of giving that God is looking for. Give us who work hard. Give us who sweat. So tonight, I just want to agree with you in prayer. Just as we agree for people to be healed. A few years ago, I preached somewhere and I did an altar call of those who want to escape poverty. Because when we want people to be saved, we say, altar call, come and receive Christ. We want them to heal, to be healed, we say, come, and we lay hands on them. So I say, I'm going to lay hands on you that the provisions of this scripture will become real in your life. That from today, when you sweat and you toil, the earth will produce for you. I believe there are magnificent wealth hold us in this place. I believe that God is going to prosper you crazily, abundantly. Your children are going to prosper like you've never seen before. Money will become an easy commodity for you. Abundance will become easy for you. In times of competition, God will give you the winning edge. He will give you extra that takes you further because the Spirit of God will accelerate your effort. When you take one step, He will accelerate it to five steps and He will give you the advantage. But you have to work hard. 
And if you have had poverty in your family, just step out of it. Don't, 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 don't go and even deal with it spiritually. Christ has dealt with it. Just say, as for me and my house, we prosper. My grandfather was a thief. I am not a thief. My great-grandfather stole a goat. I haven't stolen a goat. I received the blessing of Christ, not the curse of my grandfather, not the curse of my village, not the curse of my ancestors, not the curse of the nation. If Nigeria is producing thorns, God is able to make you eat from this land. In the land where everybody complains, God is able to give you abundance. So I just want to come into agreement with you for a manifestation of massive wealth. Massive wealth. Massive wealth. Massive wealth. Massive wealth. Lift up your hands to God. Father, I come into agreement with my brothers and sisters. On the basis of Christ Jesus, who substituted and sacrificed for us, according to what the prophet said about rivers flowing in desolate heights, pools of water coming in, in the dry places, fountain heads in the valleys, According to your promise that Jesus Christ for our sake became poor, that we through his poverty might be rich. I speak for the release from every remnant of poverty in a mindset, in a thinking pattern, in a way that we have submitted to it. I break that spirit in the name of Jesus. And may the wealth of Christ be manifested in your life. May your hands hold wealth. May your hands touch wealth. May your hands receive wealth. May your hands create wealth. May your words be wealthy. May your sweat be fruitful. May your labor be fruitful. May your hard work be fruitful. And I speak this blessing upon you by the authority of Christ and upon your children and upon your children's children and upon your children's children's children that each one born again will walk in the fruitfulness and the abundance of Christ. May today be the beginning of massive prosperity, abundant life over your life in Jesus' name. And somebody say, Amen. Why don't you go to about seven people and tell them, I am rich, I am wealthy, I am abundant, I have all wealth, I have all abundance. My cup is overflowing, my cup is overflowing, my cup is overflowing.